Welcome to the 2022 Candidates Forum, sponsored by Wallingford Community Women, in conjunction with Wallingford Government Media. I'm Jean McFarland, the program moderator. This segment features the candidates running for state representative of the 90th district. The format will be as follows. The first part of the program will consist of questions asked of the candidates by two reporters from the Record Journal. They are Jessica Sims, a Wallingford reporter, and Lau Guzman, reporter for the Latino Communities Reporting Lab. The second part will allow each candidate to make a closing statement. During the question and answer portion of the program, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to a question. The opposing candidate will be allowed one minute for rebuttal. To conclude the program, each candidate will have three minutes to make closing remarks. Prior to the program, a flip of the coin determined the order of questioning. Ms. Highland will be first. Before beginning the questioning, I'd like to introduce the candidates running for state representative of the 90th district. They are Rebecca Highland, Democrat, and Craig Fishbein, Republican. Ms. Sims, will you please ask the qu first question of Rebecca Highland? Anyone who pulls up to a gas pump or takes a trip to the grocery store has seen the costs of fuel and consumer goods and foods increase tremendously throughout 2022. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics in its Consumer Price Index report in September stated, area prices are generally up 7.2% in the Northeast region. If elected, what actions would you take to address inflation and reduce the costs of energy, groceries, and other consumer goods and services for Connecticut residents. Thank you. The last couple years have really hurt us in terms of COVID and the supply chain issues, the rising cost of goods, and inflation is a very, very real problem for many, many, many people, including a lot of you. We can't pretend like that doesn't exist. So, what do we do to try to help relieve the issue? Inflation in and of itself is more of a federal government indicator. In other words, there's not a ton that the state can do to stop inflation. However, there is a lot that the state can do to relieve inflation. And we need to think about what the people of Connecticut are asking for. The people who are most hit by inflation, middle class, low class workers, lower class workers, what do they need? They need assistance. And I'm not talking about welfare. I'm talking about people who are going to work every day, working hard, trying to make their lives better for their families. So what can we do to assist them? Well. This year, and I, I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't, this year, Connecticut had record-breaking tax breaks, $650 million, roughly. That included a child tax credit, that included the gas tax relief, which, when I am in Hartford, is gonna be an ongoing question. So we're gonna look at the numbers and we're gonna say, is there a way for us to continue relief such as the gas tax holiday? We need to do what we can where we can, recognizing what it is that the people are asking for. And that requires us to listen. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? So we had a minute of... Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I do that. No yep. Knowing the rules is part of the game. Yep. So. Sorry. Um, you know, we just heard about record-breaking tax relief. Inflation's still here. That record-breaking tax relief went into effect a little while ago. Inflation's still here. If anything, inflation's increased since that time. What have I done? I've been out there arguing against the increase in taxes. July 1 of this, this past summer, the diesel tax was increased by nine cents. What does that do? That increased the costs of goods and services going to your stores. 
and therefore increases inflation. That's a minute, so sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Um, my mistake. Um, Ms. Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Craig Fishbein? The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on the mental health of many of our children and youth. In Connecticut, according to the CDC, suicide is the second leading cause of death among people ages 10 to 34, and the state overall ranks 11th in the nation. What measures do you propose to help address the situation? Well, the suicide situation actually began, at least in our community, prior to the pandemic. As a member of the Wallingford Town Council, we get um, a um, questionnaire results. Um, the children are asked certain questions in school, and I, I was amazed at the, the percentage of children that have contemplated suicide was about 7% of our school population. That, that's staggering, and that was before the pandemic. I mean, since that time, last year we passed, uh, I supported HB 5001 which uh, increased the um, number of social workers available to children in our schools, um, increased funding so that uh, we could have more uh, social workers to uh, attend to these children. Um, it is a situation that I foretold, you know, as before the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I know we're limited on time here, but, um, you know, I, I spoke to a, well, I got a minute, okay. Um, I spoke to a young girl a few weeks ago who, um, in the household, there's significant domestic violence. And, you know, she expressed to me the, the thing that hurt her about the pandemic was she couldn't go to school. That was her solace to get away from the domestic violence. You know, the pandemic has opened doors to aspects of mental health that I don't think any of us had ever considered before, and, and we need to address those and continue to. Thank you. Ms. Ivan. Suicide is a, an action that is final. That means that we have to attack the problem from two prongs. One, we have to try to solve what some of the root causes are. But as we all know, solving problems is not quick. So we need to investigate ways, which we're doing through the mental health bill, to solve the root cause, the root problem, but we also need to make sure that there's emergency uh, precautions in place as well, because it's not something that we can take a wait and see approach with. First and foremost, uh, we need to start accepting and, and really integrating mental health care into a more medical approach, trying to reduce the stigma, trying to get people more urgent care so that they're not going to emergency rooms and then waiting months for uh, an appointment with medical professionals. If we're going to deal with things like the underlying causes like domestic violence, then I wouldn't vote against things like Jennifer's Law that help solve that problem. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. The next question, Ms. Sims, would you please ask of Ms. Hi Mrs. Highland? Earlier this year, state lawmakers passed legislation intended to enable local law enforcement and courts to more effectively respond to youth charged with multiple or repeat motor vehicle thefts. Do you think these measures adequately address issues of juvenile crime and motor vehicle thefts? If not, what further action would you, do you propose? So the short answer is no. I don't think that these actions will adequately address the issue in the long term. Um, this is something that I know quite a bit about uh, as a former public defender. I've actually been in the system. I've seen what works and what doesn't. Uh, retroactive punishment-oriented policies are important because we can't let crime just go. We have to address crime. But in many cases, they're a Band-Aid. Okay? If we're going to address the root problems, then we have to look at what causes crime, not just react to it after it takes place. And a lot of the things that cause crime have been known to us for decades, for centuries. We have so much science and research on this, we have to be willing to act on it. I am somebody that believes very heavily in following the facts, not engaging in fear tactics that distract us from the issue. Laws are not going to be something that solve juvenile crime. And in fact, my opponent said in 2013, and I quote, criminals don't buy, abide by the laws. So 
Further quoting my opponent, passing more laws isn't going to solve the problem just to say we did something. We need to address what leads juveniles into criminal activity. There are socioeconomic issues that we have to pay attention to, and there are home and school-based issues. So what I support is I support early intervention on a community basis. We need to deal with the family, the school, and the way that the child or the juvenile interact with one another. I am not saying that crime isn't a real thing. Crime is a very real thing. So how about we spend less money and actually try to solve the issue of crime rather than just waiting to respond? Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. Thank you. So it's quite obvious that my opponent doesn't know anything about the juvenile justice process in Connecticut. In fact, last year I gave 27 presentations across the state about the process. One of those was right here in this room. My client, uh, my opponent wasn't here. Um, at that presentation, we had Amanda Miranda, who is our youth and social services worker, that talked about community-based intervention. Um, we have that process here in Wallingford. Our chief of police was here talking about what, what happens in our community. Uh, we have those things in place that prevent a child from having to go to court the first time that they run in with the law. So, um, but the answer to the question, it doesn't go far enough. There are other things we will have to do. And uh, the numbers have dramatically increased over the last 10 years as our laws have changed and Victims have been uh, Thank you. Uh, Ms. Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein. In 2021, Connecticut towns and cities received $2.6 billion in ARPA funding. Some of these funds were allocated to schools, nonprofit organizations, mental health services, and more. This year, some of the ARPA funds were extended. For example, schools are utilizing smart funds to be able to continue to offer free meals. However, these funds will run out. If the federal government chose to extend the funding yet again, would you support it? Why or why not? The funding for the meals or just ARPA in general? ARPA in general. Well, I mean, the question is, would I support an action by the federal government? That's not something that state legislators do. Um, if I mean, when the ARP funds came from the federal government to the state government, that isn't something that we voted on. So um, I guess you're not asking about something that I would actually, it's more of a philosophical thing. I will say that um, out of control government spending is a major factor in inflation. So when government just sends a check to another faction of government with no earmarking as to specifics and just says, go figure it out, that money has to come from somewhere. And ultimately, you know, the government doesn't create a product, so to speak. They've got to raise taxes in order to generate funds so that money can come to the state. When they raise taxes, somebody's got to pay those taxes. And, you know, it's businesses, it's people like you and I, you know, and, and that is pure inflation. So if the question came across my desk, you know, the federal government wants to send a certain amount of money to Connecticut, I'm sure they're not going to earmark just Connecticut. They're going to say, you know, California is going to get five times what that is. Um, you know, more than likely I would be adverse to that. So thank you. Mrs. Highland. So as we know, um, ARPA is a temporary solution and it's been fantastic in the way that it's been able to help localities overcome a lot of the issues from COVID. But let's talk about a perfect example of how the money does have to come from somewhere and how the legislature can create solutions that don't require imposing further taxes on most of the people. Let's talk about the diesel tax. The diesel tax was passed because the special transportation fund was close to being in the red. Within a few years, there was gonna be no money in the special transportation fund to fix bridges and roads. In order for us to get the federal funding that we rely upon in order to fix our bridges and roads, we as a state have to match that money to a certain extent. 
Tractor trailers, an average 18-wheeler tractor trailer that is filled to the brim, does as much damage to the road as 10,000 personal cars. The average cost is $15 to the truck, Connecticut end-to-end, -end, for the 60% of tractor trailers Thank that you. are passed through. Thank you. So, Ms. Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? Do you support efforts to promote diversity and inclusion in the classroom through initiatives like the state-mandated elective Black and Latino Studies? I do. I absolutely do. So <clears throat> one of the keys to working on issues of diversity is recognizing the bias that each and every one of us has from walking in the shoes that we were born into. Every person, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, their religion, has bias. Simply because you cannot understand another person's day-to-day -day realities. You can try to educate yourself, and we should. In fact, it's imperative upon us to educate ourselves to the greatest extent possible what other people are going through. And in order to shift that cultural acceptance of diversity and the fact that it's okay to recognize that you have limited experience in certain areas, we need to start that young. We want to encourage kids to recognize the diversity of their peers, not only because that ingrains in children at a young age that diversity is okay and is in fact beautiful, but it also helps build the confidence of the children who fall into those minority classes. The biggest thing that we can do with children to help anti-racist efforts is exposure. We know from studies that children who grow up in households of mixed race or multiple backgrounds tend to have less reactive bias. When I say reactive bias, I mean things that we can't control. Exposure, learning, education, acceptance of our limitations, and the willingness to learn from others is what will help us move closer to less and less uh, racism and issues with diversity. So yes, I do support that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fishbein? Yes, so I support that also, and I have a few examples. You know, one of the problems with diversity from my perspective is something looking foreign to you. So um, there was a bill, uh, and I don't remember the number, um, that talked about that um, there had to, it was a, an incentive program to um, incentivize minority individuals to become teachers. I supported that. That's a good thing. When a student knows that, or recognizes that the person at the front of the class that they look up to, that they are learning from, is different than they are, that breaks down barriers. Similar with police. There's a portion of the police accountability bill that I supported, which has a requirement that um, there's a certain number of police officers based upon uh, demographics um, to incentivize police officers to be minorities in, on that force. Thank you. Ms. Sims, would you ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? The National School Board Associ so Association cites that, st that studies show that all students benefit when they have access to teachers of color, especially black and Latino children. To what extent should local school districts focus their efforts on recruiting a diverse educator workforce? Yeah, it's generally what I was just discussing. So, um, you know, I'm in favor of that. I, um, you know, I spend a lot of time with kids, and, um, uh, well, I'll tell you, I used to work out at the Y um, b before COVID, and uh, one of my favorite things is to sit in the sauna after a workout. And invariably, there was kids there that were minorities, and I used to love to have conversations with them about you know, the, their lives compared to my life, you know, because I'm a white middle class male. Um, and I would learn things from that. And it's the same sort of situation. It's that give and take. Um, I'm totally in support of that. 
And I, I think that, um, you know, incentivizing people who are minorities to uh, be at the front of a class, to speak, and um, to show kids that we are all basically so similar, although we look different. Um, I, I think that that is something that we, we should be uh, cherishing. Thank you. Mrs. Highland. Absolutely. So I, I think the question is what can we do to try to uh, increase the workforce to try to help people from diverse backgrounds get into the educating field. First, we need to address what's preventing people from getting into the education field in the first place. Um, we, we don't give our educators the resources that they need to do their jobs to the best of their ability. Now, that is gonna disproportionately affect people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds, which tend to be disproportionately people from minority classes. So we've gotta figure out a way to allow people who come from more disadvantaged backgrounds, whether those people are from a minority class or not, to have education that doesn't hamper them with student loans before they go become a teacher and don't get paid a whole ton. It's, it's things like that that are actual steps we can take. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? As Latinos become a growing segment of the Connecticut population, how do you plan on reaching out to the Latino community you might serve? So, the first thing that I hope to demonstrate is that I am aware of my own limitations when it comes to the Latino population, the Latinx population, because I'm not from a Latinx background. I'm, I'm a white girl who grew up in Connecticut, and there's nothing wrong with that, but what that requires is my own acknowledgement of that limitation, and then first, the willingness to listen. So often, we find ourselves um, preaching from a position of power uh, in, in talking about what we think should be done. When in reality, we need to look to the people who are experiencing whatever the issue may be in this situation, in this question, we're talking about the Latinx population. So we need to engage in a substantive manner, not just superficial, but in a substantive manner with the Latinx community. We need to invite comments and we need to invite them reaching out to us from the non-Latinx community and we also have to be willing to respond. To say I hear and I'm trying to figure out a way to successfully implement what it is you're asking for. That requires um, putting ego aside and really sitting down and thinking what is it that these people need? And it, it doesn't just apply to this particular question. It, it applies really to all communities from which I don't come from. Um, so there's a lot of openness and communication and willingness to listen and change that has to be um, seriously, seriously enacted. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. So here in Wallingford, we have the Spanish community of Wallingford. Um, Maria Harlow used to be the executive director. Maria and I had plenty of conversations about um, the um, Hispanic community, their needs, their wants. Um, I have an open door policy. You know, I have various email addresses. Um, I recently, when I say recent, um, I think six months ago, had a very lengthy Zoom conversation with the, the current executive director of SCOW. We talked about some of the, a lot of the same issues. We talked about how their organization runs and, you know, the trouble they're having fundraising in the community, um, things like that. So, um, you know, the question sort of imposes um, or presumes that the representative imposed themselves on the group. Uh, I think it's a two-way street, so um, I'm willing to have whatever conversations need to be had. Thank you. 
Ms. Sims, would you ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? How would you increase access to quality health care in Connecticut, particularly among underserved communities? Sure. Um, I, I guess that's assuming that some health care in Connecticut is not quality, but I will set that aside for right now. You know, one of the issues that we have in Connecticut is what is known as the Certificate of Need. Uh, most people don't know about that. The acronym is CON. If I have a uh, medical facility and I want to put in an, an x-ray item, um, and um, it may be cutting edge technology, I can't, in the medical field in Connecticut, go buy that technology. I can't increase availability of service. And that's what you're talking about, you know, having more quality health care. I have to apply for permission to buy that machinery. I have to get a certificate of need. It's something that I've been opposed to because I think, you know, competition is healthy. Um, and if there is a lack of medical care, you know, certainly competition, um, you know, if there's a, um, a lack of uh, service that can be rendered, uh, one of the ways is to take down that barrier with certificates of need. Um, so I've been active with trying to get rid of that process in Hartford, um, and I think that's one, one area that we can um, deal with that uh, moving forward. Thank you. Mrs. Highland. So we need to be willing to take on the insurance lobby to a certain extent because a large portion or a large reason that our, our costs are so high, which then leads to health care issues, is because of insurance. And I was speaking to somebody the other day who works for a small business. Um, this person, between their premium, their costs for prescription coverages and their deductibles, if they pay all of that for themselves, their spouse, and their one child, it's $22,000 a year. And that is regardless of whether they are the highest paying person on that insurance plan or the person who makes $50,000 a year before taxes. So we've got to take on the insurance lobby so that small businesses can then offer prescription plans that are not so cost prohibitive to both themselves and their employees that we can drive down the costs. We also need to cap prescription costs like insulin. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sims, would you ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? Do you agree with the U.S. Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade and do you support the state's safe harbor law, and can you explain? Sure. I absolutely do not support the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs, which is what overturned Roe v. Wade, and I do support Connecticut's safe harbor laws. The one place, well, there are many places, but the government should certainly not be in the private office between a woman and her doctor. And it is not the government's job to tell a woman how to handle her pregnancy. And quite frankly, the results of this decision are really gonna affect working families and people who are struggling to get by. Because those are the people, the working families, the people who are working hard to raise their children, the people who are working hard to get to work every day, the people who don't have a lot of sick days, the people who need help, those are the, gonna be the people who are disproportionately affected by the Dobbs decision. Now, we are safe in Connecticut right now. Connecticut is a fantastic state. Connecticut protects its people, and Connecticut goes out of its way to help its people. We are safe right now, right now. But there are people, including my opponent, who have actively worked to reduce reproductive protections in the state of Connecticut, including by representing an out-of-state pro-life organization suing our state over reproductive rights, packaged as a First Amendment claim, but if you read more than the first paragraph, you know what it is. We have got to make sure that not only do we continue to protect the women in our state and the families in our state, 
but that we are aware of the ongoing efforts to take away those very, very personal and individual rights. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. So I'm, I'm used to individuals that aren't licensed to practice law in our state denigrating what I do for a living. But we move on from that. The Dobbs decision, instead of fear-mongering, really has to do with the Constitution. It talks about states' rights. Those that have actually read the decision will understand that. I agree with the ultimate decision is that the states have the choice to do certain things that are not expressly dealt with in the federal constitution. That has been the law for years. The safe harbor law is a longer conversation. I will tell you that the safe harbor portions of that law I fervently favor. In fact, I worked very hard to make that law stronger. It is the other portions of that bill that allowed midwives to do abortions. They are not trained to do that I oppose. The safe harbor provision I very much support it, and it's a longer conversation. Thank you. Ms. Guzman, would you ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? Recently, Governor Ned Lamont announced that in collaboration with the CT Office of Early Childhood and the New United Way of Connecticut, that child care workers will be receiving a pay bonus as a way to show gratitude for their work. How else do you think that the government could support child care workers at this time and make child care more affordable for Connecticut families? Well, that's assuming that the action by the governor is one that I support because the child care workers are not the ones with the children. So was there a requirement when the governor gave the child care workers money that they reduce their fees or that, so it was just a blank check. So I don't know how that helps the mom with the child. Um, you know, those sorts of programs during an election season are merely buying votes. That is not something that the legislature was able to debate or talk about. Um, you know, the governor found money in the budget and said, well, it sort of fits this, it's maybe a little gray and I'll buy some more votes. Um, you know, practical relief is probably more appropriate. Uh, making it easier for people to get licensed um, as child care providers is, is an area that could be dealt with. Uh, reducing the licensing fees. You know, licensing by the state is not a warranty to a parent that their child is going to be safe. It's merely a revenue raising aspect. So making that more available by reducing fees and saying to people that it's easier to get a license, we want everybody to operate lawfully is perhaps the best way to provide for child care that is not being provided previously. Thank you. Mrs. Island. So I'm not sure that I would consider um, a $1,000 one-time check, a blank check to somebody who makes um, 25, 30 grand a year. Um, I do support that $1,000 payment. Uh, I'm not also sure that as a parent of a three-year-old child, I want the solution to child care uh, deficiencies to be making it easier for people by reducing the requirements of licensure. Um, what I do want is for actual action to be taken to make it easier for parents to put their children in child care and go to work. And it's not moms with children, it's parents with children. It's every family that during COVID had to become a one income household. So what we need to do is we need to look at universal pre-K. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sims, would you ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? How do you think the state of Connecticut and the town of Wallingford could improve access to public transportation? Public transportation is a huge deficit in this country. Um, when we look at 
European nations and we see the availability of public transportation, the way that people can move about, um, it, it's startling in contrast. Um, so, one of the areas we need to do is we need to talk to the people in the disability sphere and we need to talk to disability advocates because very often it, it is the disabled community that will rely on public transportation. So I've heard examples of uh, people waiting for their transportation to show up to bring them somewhere and it gets canceled um, and they don't find out till they've missed their doctor's appointment or taking a public bus uh, somewhere and then not having the bus be able to return. Public transportation is also something that's gonna help alleviate the climate crisis. It's gonna help alleviate the cost of gas on people trying to get to work. So, public transportation is a very real necessity. We need to widen the available hours, especially for places that are not uh, urban locations. There needs to be a way for people from more rural locations to get to more urban locations. We need to widen the accessibility to shopping centers and make sure that people have reliable, reliable transportation to get to and from those places. There's a lot that needs to be investigated in terms of our infrastructure. We can't have public transportation that we don't then support by improving the roads, by increasing the improvements on the buses, by investing in clean energy so that the buses that we're driving aren't contributing to the carbon crisis. So there's a lot that we can do uh, once we're willing to, to look the problem in the face. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. So um, I am very happy about the train that we have, um, the improvements that we've made in the downtown. I've, I've used the train. Um, you know, something that a lot of people don't know is that Wallingford actually pays for its bus service. In our budget, it's about $70,000. Wallingford is one of the only towns in the state of Connecticut that actually pays. I did an FOI request on uh, CTDOT a few years ago to find out most towns in, this, um, in the state pay nothing. And, you know, Waterbury, for example, uh, is a $12 million expenditure to the state, and they pay absolutely nothing for their bus service. They've got an extensive bus service. Wallingford has virtually nothing. I actually proposed on the town council a few years ago that we not pay the state anything and then let them come to us, and maybe they'll renegotiate the routes. Um, you know, I have actively been working in this area and um, have sought the investigation and look to expand our uh, Thank you. public service. <clears throat> Ms. Guzman, would you ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? To what extent did you support the state police accountability law that was passed in 2020? Do you know it's like 700 pages long? You're gonna ask me to what extent? Um, that's a, you know, there's so many things in there. Um, there is some good stuff in there. Most of it is bad. Um, for instance, a good thing, you know, I do work before the Board of Pardons and Paroles and, you know, I've been before the board and um, I've seen cases where somebody doesn't get their, their pardon and the board just says, thank you, have a good day. Well, I don't think that that person actually knows what they need to do to get a proper application before the board, right? You know, do some more community service, you know, wait some more time. So I actually had put in the police accountability bill that the board of pardons, when they deny an application, has to tell them why they're denying it. Makes sense, right? Then we have, um, you know, use of force in the original bill. Um, when an officer could use use of force was a totally new standard, not used by any other state um, it went even further than California. Um, and this past legislative session, I took it upon myself to get that changed uh, to what's known as the Graham standard, um, which is a, a federal standard that every other state uses. Um, and we had to do some procedural things to get it there. But ultimately, I think it was unanimous um, that we got that changed. So, you know, police accountability bill is like a whole day seminar and we don't have a whole day. I got 30 seconds. Um, 
you know, there's other FOI issues that are in the police accountability bill that, you know, protected officers from um, uh, when there's a, a bad thing that happens in their file from that being released. That's something that I did not support. Um, you know, so for the most part, I'm 70% against the police accountability bill in its current form. So, thank, thank you. you. Mrs. Highland. I do support the police accountability bill, and I find it uh, particularly frustrating when someone claims to uh, be in support of the police as a state representative while simultaneously suing the state to put the guns back on the streets that are used to kill the police officers. I have been endorsed by Council for AFSCME, which represents 19 local police stations, including Wallingford. I know that our police need more support. They need resources to help them do the jobs that keep us safe. And I'll tell you what, one of the things that's not helping them and not keeping us safe is fighting to put high-powered weapons on the street. So I support the police accountability bill, but I support the police. Thank you. Ms. Guzman, would you ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? In what ways do you think the town of Wallingford has been sustainable, and in what ways do you think it could improve, and how would you assist in these efforts? It's very important that a state representative have the ability to work with and communicate with the town representatives and the town government um, that they represent at the state level. That's within their district. And Wallingford um, is in desperate need of upgrades, uh, which will lead to more sustainability. Um, we, quite frankly, should be able to pay our electric bill online and not have to fill out a check or paperwork, which then is put in the mail, increasing the uh, waste that goes every month and every three months for your water bill. So there are a lot of really little things that seem big. And yeah, they require an upfront cost. Can't deny that. But when we disregard infrastructure and improvements for decades, then what would have cost a smaller sum becomes exponentially more expensive. Other things that state reps can do are things similar to what Mary Mashinsky was able to negotiate. She was able to negotiate an increase in the grant to Wallingford, meaning money that was there, that she then got to come to us to connect the Quinnipiac River Trail to Yalesville, which oddly enough, Yalesville, for the most part, is not in her district. But she took it upon herself to help negotiate and bring that bridge connecting Yalesville to the Quinnipiac River Trail so that when it's done, residents can go from one side of Wallingford to the other without using a car. We've got to be willing to think creatively outside of the box and then follow through. Thank you. Mr. Fishbein. So I don't know which bridge you just heard about, but that's part of the problem not being involved with the community. The bridge that's there now, um, actually the, the residents of the condo association threatened to sue the town about. Um, there's been a lot of problems over there about representations. So I just, you know, limited time, but I don't get it on the bridge. You know, sustainability, one of the things, you know, sustainability has to do with being able to be self-sufficient to a certain extent. And on an environmental basis, you know, one of the things that I took up over the last year is composting, which I actually, I got a flyer outside of the door of the table here about composting. That's where I learned about composting. That's something that we can try and do as a town to uh, incentivize, and, and we had a presentation here, um, Councilor Testa gave us a few weeks ago about sustainability um, with our town, and, and we're looking at things in that regard, so I know my time's up. So. Thank you. 
Ms. Sims, would you ask the next question of Mr. Fishbein? <clears throat> With the suspension of the gas tax and proposals to further extend the suspension, how do you expect to fund current transportation projects? Would you support the impl implementation of tolls in Connecticut? No, I am opposed to tolls. The, the problem with the transportation, it's a great question because we heard about the transportation fund before. The problem with the transportation fund is when it was originally created, the purpose of the fund was to pay for the roads. So almost like an enterprise fund, um, you know, you, you put a certain number, of, certain amount of money in the account, and you just use it for the roads. The problem is the eroding of the use of the transportation fund. All of a sudden, it became well, you know, we use um, state police officers to patrol the roads. So you know, it really should come out of the transportation fund, and you know, we're, um, you know, um, Connecticut. Uh, they're trimming the trees along the roads and that kind of stuff. And while it may be a, a, a town state project for whatever reason, we're, we're going to take the money out of the transportation fund. And before you knew it, um, there was no money in the transportation fund. We've been pushing for an audit of the transportation fund for years now. Can't get it. You know, it's one thing asking for things when you're in the minority. Um, the majority has to drive that. So why they won't permit an audit of the special transportation fund, I don't know. Um, but I am opposed to tolls because it's just more money and um, it's not going to be used appropriately given the track record. So thank you. Mrs. Highland. It's very easy to criticize where money is coming from. Um, without proposing a solution as to then where the money should come from. Uh, and I, I find it hard to believe that the solution to a problem is by blaming the original creation of the law. It's there, we have it. So, as I was briefly talking about earlier, the diesel tax, that actually was an alternative to tolls that would affect all of the people on the road. Take the GW Bridge in New York. To cross the GW Bridge in New York, a tractor trailer has to pay $100. The equivalent of that in Connecticut for that tractor trailer to travel from one end of the state to the other in diesel tax is $15. Connecticut with its diesel tax is not causing inflation. So tolls, Thank you. My time's up. Thank you. Ms. <clears throat> Guzman, would you please ask the next question of Mrs. Highland? What would you do to address the recent rise in homelessness in Connecticut? So homelessness is an issue that can be um, looked at from varying perspectives depending on why that individual might be homeless. Uh, in one area, we have issues with family homelessness, uh, parents being homeless with children. We also have issues with homelessness that tends to uh, result from either mental illness or untreated mental illness, um, or people who have been recently released from incarceration and don't have sufficient resources uh, to find a steady place to live. So. Depending on which area we're looking at, we need to come up with the appropriate solutions. Now, one of the things that we can do to help alleviate homelessness would be to vastly improve our public transportation so that people who want to work, which is most people who want to work, can get to work. But if you have to come up with enough money to get a car, to pay for gas and insurance, and to live somewhere where you can park that car, that's a whole heck of a lot different than if you can afford to take public transportation to your job. When we talk about families and children, let's talk about feeding children more expansively in school to help alleviate that need for the parents who are trying to put a roof over their children's head. Again, I think one of the traps that we fall into 
is not being willing to think outside the box and, and trying to come up with band-aids for solutions which tend to be cheaper, but in the long run are more expensive. And we're seeing that with our infrastructure problems right now. Um, so it's a, a multifaceted question with multiple approaches. And thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fishbein. <clears throat> I think I agree with everything I just heard, actually. Um, you know, a few years ago, I took a uh, tour. Um, the Connecticut Coalition for the Homeless, um, we went to the 211 Center on Rocky Hill, in Rocky Hill, and then we took um, a, a bus to Middletown, which is the area that services um, our, our shelter services here in town. Um, and then uh, we went to a shelter, you know, and saw what goes on there. And uh, we ended up um, at another shelter and just had a, a round table about the issue in the state. And, and we thinking outside the box, trying to look at some things we could do. You know, I, time is limited, but one of the things I heard I was incarceration, uh, one of the bills that I supported you know, when people get out of jail, um, they used to give them a check that they couldn't cash. And uh, myself and a legislator in Hartford proposed a bill that um, mandated they get a debit card. Thank you. So. Ms. Sims, would you ask the last question of Mr. Fishbein? Last year, the CDC reported over 100,000 drug overdose deaths, the highest number ever reported nationally. What steps do you think the legislator should take as a response? Well, I'm going to tell you it's going to get worse. Um, you know, the legalization of marijuana that um, I very much opposed uh, without research um, is going to lead to, in my opinion, more people that are uh, satisfied with numbing themselves you know it was uh, tragic that when we had the public hearing on that bill that not one individual from the department of mental health and addiction showed up in support of that bill nor did they submit anything in opposition i mean that is their job and um for whatever reason would not opine on that very dramatic thing that you are going to see negatively affecting. We're already seeing it in kids with the edibles. We're already seeing, I mean, DPH will tell you, there have been so many incidents in this state since the legalization, the passage, even, even when edibles weren't legal, um, of kids getting a hold of, of edibles. You know, you had the, the fentanyl overdose of the child in Hartford um, it's, it's just, it's going to get worse. I, um, so fighting legalization of things like that is probably a, a place to start, but that, uh, that is out of the bag and, um, we should have had the testing before. And I know Representative Mashinsky was shoulder to shoulder with me on the opposition of that. And I thank her for that. So thank you. Mrs. Highland. Um, so it's not my opinion, it's a fact that um, marijuana actually is not a gateway drug as was so um, often beat into our heads kind of in that D.A.R.E. program we all took. That being said, there actually is a ton of research on what happens when marijuana is illegalized. That's a red herring. That's not addressing the heart of the issue. The opioid epidemic comes in most part due to the pharmaceutical industry putting out high-powered painkillers with misleading statistics, misleading research that then people became addicted to. Part of the reason that the epidemic caught us so off guard is because it affected communities that we didn't normally suspect or expect to be affected by drug addiction. People in the upper class, people with white collar jobs. And that's because those were the people that were pretty much given unlimited access to painkillers which led to the opioid addictions that have led to the epidemic. So first, you have to understand the cause of the epidemic. Second, we can do things like Narcan training, making Narc, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer portion of the program. Each candidate will now have three minutes to make a closing statement.
Rebecca Highland, would you please begin? Sure. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having me here and for being here and for listening. And for those of you who will listen later, thank you. I love Connecticut. Connecticut is where my husband and I chose to buy our first home. It's where we decided to start our family. And because of that, I have a vested interest in not only keeping Connecticut great for the things that make it so great, but also improving its weaknesses. In my role as an attorney, I saw the effect of government overreach and unchecked power. I saw that. In my role as a teacher, I got to know families and students from a different perspective, teachers from a different perspective. And having my son Henry in 2019 is truthfully what gave me the courage to actually run. Um, I don't know that I would have, had, would have had the courage to do this if it weren't for that drive. And that drive can be anything for lots of people. For me, it's my son Henry. I will not stop trying to make Connecticut better for all of us until I'm not allowed to try anymore. And that's because I know that what makes us better is when we support each other and we work together for solutions. This is not about party, this is not about politics, it's about people. And in order for us, so I, I've talked to thousands of people at this point from all political affiliations, and there's something that has become so clear to me, and that's we want the same things, right? We want our loved ones to be healthy. We want our loved ones to be happy. We want our loved ones to feel safe. And we want opportunities to do better. We have some very valid disagreements about how to get there. But we're not going to solve the problem by digging our heels in and engaging in partisan politics. We're not. We've got to start to embrace one another and recognize that this goes above and beyond party affiliation. You know, experience is only as good as your willingness to use it to help the people that you represent. And in that vein, past behavior and records speak about future. I know that when we start to support one another, we're all going to thrive together, and we're going to do better. Thank you. Craig Fishbein, would you please give your statement? So I lived in this town almost my entire life. Um, I've served in the legislature for the last six years, been on the town council for well over a decade. Um, I have a voting record. I stand for smaller government, lower taxes, less interference in the day-to-day -day affairs of our law-abiding citizens. You know, up in Hartford, they don't publicly admit it, but a lot of the Democrats in leadership like the fact that I do listen that we work together on bills. You know, that, that Safe Harbor bill that we briefly touched on before, essentially what it does is, you know, apparently Texas passed a law that says that if a Texas resident goes to Connecticut, for example, and gets an abortion, that anybody that facilitates that process can be sued in Texas. I take offense at that. It's not appropriate. If it's a lawful act here in our state, and our state has determined that to be a lawful act, it should not be actionable in another state. That's what the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution is there for. The problem with this, the Safe Harbor Bill as it presently was, as it was originally presented, was it permitted what's known as trouble damages. Get a judgment in Texas, then you can get a judgment here in Connecticut against the Texas people that sued you down there. You can get 
triple times the damages. And my problem with that is, okay, then Texas is going to modify their law that says you can get six times the damages. So I said, no, let's just make everybody whole. We bring an action in Texas as a result of this, if that's found to be constitutional, then you make them whole here in Connecticut. That's a true safe harbor bill. And, and but for my negotiating with the other side on that and working on that bill, that, that bill would have had a lot more trouble. It probably would have been found to be unconstitutional at some point. That's the reason why I supported that. But on the morning of that bill getting called, the other side of the Democrats knew that I was going to support it. And they merged it with a public health bill that allowed for um, midwives to do abortions that they are not trained on. It was admitted during the public hearing. They are not trained, it's not part of their scope to learn how to do abortions. That's the last thing that I want to see is that back alley abortion and that's what that law permitted. And therefore I had to vote against it. So vote for me again, please. Thank you, my time's up. Thank you. This concludes the state representative 90th district segment of the 2022 Candidates Forum. On behalf of the Wallingford community women, I thank you for watching and remind you to vote on November 8th.